Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Guilford Community Church on this palmless Palm Sunday. I'm not sure what happened, but we didn't end up with palms this morning, so I apologize for that. We had palms the last two years when there were no one in the sanctuary. <laughs> the beautiful flowers under the cross are given by Donna Mooney and her granddaughter, Ashley LaCase, in memory of their father, Kevin. And the flowers in front of the pulpit are given by the Grams and Bannon family, in loving memory of our son, CJ. And um, we, we did the slice of the pie drawing, and I thought we were supposed to do six drawings, but we were supposed to do ten. <clears throat> so this morning, we have four winners and a bunch of losers. <laughs> Now, I, I think we need to question this because Stacy Pate was the person drawing the cards. <laughs> and the first card she drew was Stacy Pate. <laughs> and then <clears throat> Carolyn Ames ran into some car trouble last night. We're going to help her with $100. And <clears throat> Virginia Babcock won for the second time. And then Dennis Franciosi will be thrilled to know that his wife will treat him to McDonald's because <laughs> she was the other big winner. <laughs> and then immediately following our worship service, please join us downstairs in our fellowship hall for coffee hour. And there is going to be a meet and greet in the corner conference room. If you've been coming for some time and would like to learn a little bit more about the church, or perhaps even explore what it might mean to be a member, I'd encourage you to come. And now I just invite you to take a moment to reflect on why we have gathered here today. Thank you. That was beautiful. Please join me now in a word of prayer. We come here this morning not because God sits enthroned in the clouds waiting to hear our supplications and accolades. We come because we have hopes that we might narrow the gap between what we say we believe and how we actually live. Love is our religion, so today we seek to lay aside those things that clearly are not love rejecting all judgment, resentment, and malice. We choose now to increase our kindness and to grow in our respect for one another. And now we repeat these ancient words which picture God as our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now stand as we sing together hymn number 213, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. morning scripture reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there tied a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it, and will bring it back immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying this colt? They told him that Jesus said the, that Jesus, what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who were ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Steph uh, Stacy and um, <laughs> Stephanie, and uh, <laughs> and if April and Melody will come forward, we'll have our time together. Well, good morning. And the two of you have come to my rescue so many times the past five or six months. I think, I think you should turn in a time card to Carl Carter. He'll start paying you for all the help you've been providing me. But I want to thank you for lighting those candles again. You did a wonderful, wonderful job. 
Now, at the beginning of the service, I said this was what Sunday? <laughs> and normally, we would hand you palm, palm, palms, things that grow on palm trees. It's, a, it's a, like a leaf that grows on a palm tree. And on, on Palm Sunday, we remember that Jesus processed into Jerusalem and some people put palm branches down and other put their coats down and he, he came in on, on a donkey. And um, but what I wanted to think of, what I wanted to talk about this morning is what, when was the last time you made a mistake? A day ago? That's pretty good. So I woke up yesterday morning and I had a great sense of panic. Because I, I thought I was going to get to church on Saturday morning and go to the flower room and there wasn't going to be palm branches. You have beautiful flowers on your, on your sandal or your shoes. Maybe we could use those instead of palm branches. You want to take them off? No? Okay. So when I got to church, I immediately darted to the flower room and I thought, oh, let's, I just hoped and I hoped and I crossed my fingers and I said, let there, let there be palms and there were no palms. <laughs> and when something like that happens, what, my, at least my first tendency, I don't know about anyone else, but when something like that happens, I, I usually do two things. First, I want to blame someone else. <laughs> or I want to make an excuse. Excuses or blame someone else, like your sister, huh? <laughs> well, blame someone else is like not taking responsibility. Yeah, like if you took a cookie out of the cookie jar, and your mom said, who took the cookie? And you said, my little sister. That's blaming someone else. Oh, but, but, but it was a good cookie, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's important when something doesn't go right, when we, when we make a mistake, that we don't try to make an excuse and we don't look to blame someone. We just try to make sure it doesn't happen again. So if there are no palms next, next year on Palm Sunday, maybe someone needs to sit me down and say, what's up, Mr. Grant? <laughs> Thanks for coming up.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. I don't have any new prayer concerns to share with you this morning, but I obviously would ask us all to keep on our hearts and prayers the people in Ukraine. So far, we've collected about $2,500 in church member donations. We can continue to collect those funds until the end of the month, and then we're going to send them to Church World Service, um, with the outstanding organization, and we'll use the money very wisely. So please, please be in a spirit of prayer. All of us from time to time are guilty of mistaking having informed opinions for actually doing something of importance. Together may we strive to marry our hearts to our minds, that the way we live will reflect what we say we believe. May we reject those moments of smug self-righteousness, and free ourselves from the paralysis of cynicism, that we might enthusiastically renew our hearts to be filled with passion to live, work, and sacrifice, so that we might see justice become a reality, and compassion the character of our society. This is our prayer. Amen.
Thank you, Carolyn May, Judy, and Jane. Please stand now as we sing hymn number 216, All Glory, Out and Honor. For a year, for a year, Freddie Wall and I worked side by side. Our shift started at 11 p.m. I was always a few minutes early. Freddie punched in at 11, not a second before. If he happened to arrive a few minutes early, he stood by the time clock and waited till it hit 11. Now, I was a part-timer, Freddie a full-timer. He didn't, he didn't work full-time, but he was paid for 40 hours. We were both package handlers at UPS. UPS was the perfect environment for someone like me, someone a bit anal, someone who colors between the lines. Now, we worked in front of this giant metal slide about 40 feet long and about 30 feet deep. High above us, high above us was a conveyor belt that delivered packages to the slide. Could you turn me down just a little bit? UPS leaves nothing to chance. There is a rule for absolutely everything. You're taught how to position yourself in front of the slide. You're taught how to sort packages. You grabbed a box like this. If the label wasn't up, you turned the box this way, and then you scanned only for the zip code. Then you place the package, not toss, toss it, mind you, but place the package in a large metal bin. There were five trains trying five train boxes with three containers, compartments. And sometimes at night, I have UPS dreams. <laughs> in, the dream, the fill, the, the, in the dream, the slide is filled with thousands of boxes. They're coming faster than I can sort. The dream has a little Lucy and Ethel feel to it. <laughs> in my dream, I'll see boxes with zip codes from Bowie or Greenbelt or College Park or Atlanta, Maryland. It's been 32 years since I handled the package, but I still remember some of those zip codes and where they were to be sorted. 
Now, on a Thursday night, after that first year, I said goodbye to Freddie and drove the 40 minutes home. I hadn't said anything to Freddie or any other, uh, other guys I worked with, but come Sunday night, when I returned to work, I wouldn't be sorting packages. I'd been promoted to supervisor. Now, I was a little embarrassed by the promotion. The guys I worked with regularly poked fun at management. Would they think I was Judas? And so as I made my way to work that night, I was a little bit nervous for a few reasons. First, I didn't know what my assignment would be. And then I worried about how I would be greeted by my buddy package handlers. But I quickly would find out my assignment was the worst possible assignment. I was told that I needed to stand next to Freddy and make sure he worked all night long. So I'd stand next to him with the stopwatch. Package handlers were required to sort 600 boxes of an hour, 10 a minute. You can do that if you stay focused. And I, I loved sorting packages, but I hated harassing Freddy. Freddy made those first couple of months miserable. He deliberately sorted in slow motion. And every time he did, I would have to stop him. Then I had to demonstrate to him how the job was to be done. <laughs> demonstrate to someone who knew far better than I how to do the job. And I, I, tried, I tried to be positive. Anything he did well, I would encourage him and praise him. But he played me like Charlie Daniels played the fiddle. And when push came to shove, Freddie would play this card. It's not in my job description. And technically, you see, he was right. Handling packages was in the job description, but the job description didn't spell out how many packages were to be sorted an hour. In the end, I failed miserably, just like everyone else did with Freddie. Not in my job description. That's what I was thinking about as we inch a little bit closer to the last days of Jesus' life. Today is Palm Sunday, but it's also, also Passion Sunday. The one is joyous and celebratory, the other dark and filled with pain and suffering, but every life knows both of those things. But thinking about today, I got thinking about Freddie and those job descriptions. You see, suffering hanging on a cross wasn't in the job description of the Messiah. Jesus easily could have pulled the Freddy cross. That ain't in the job description. For you see, for about 800 years before Jesus, there had been a one ad running in the Jerusalem Times. There were lots of applicants, but the position went unfilled. During those years, many were looking for a Messiah. Now, Messiah didn't mean then what it came to mean to Christians. But almost since the death of, of King David and his son Solomon, the nation had experienced tough time after tough time. Defeat after defeat, if not from Egypt, then from Assyria, later Babylon, and after that the Persians and Greeks, and in Jesus' time, the Romans. And had you been reading your Jerusalem Times around the time of Jesus, the ad would have read something like this. We are searching for the next Messiah, who, like our great King David, will lead the nation with power, defeat our enemies, and usher in a reign of peace and prosperity. Would-be applicants should possess savvy military skills, be able to command an army. And the next part of the ad almost has a contemporary ring to it. The Messiah must be able to make Israel great again. It's entirely possible, had you been walking around the streets of Jerusalem in the days of Jesus, you might have seen someone sporting a mega hat. Make Israel great again. That's precisely, exactly what the job description was. Make Israel great again. Yet astonishingly, none of those things were on Jesus' agenda. There's not a trace of nationalism in him. He didn't ever say, there's no hint of imperialism. 
And nowhere is this more evident than on Palm Sunday when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a beast of burden, not a warrior's horse. Not an army by his side, but a ragtag group of disciples. And in the telling of the story, as they drew near to Jerusalem, some disciples and a group of desperate people cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, a wonderful Hebrew word that means save us. But Jesus wouldn't deliver on that. And by the end of the week, those who cried out, Hosanna, now were shouting, crucify him. Jesus wouldn't rescue Israel from the Romans. Rather, he seemed to suggest that we need to be rescued not from the Romans, but from ourselves. We need to be delivered from our tendency to be self-seeking, our propensity to think that we're just a little bit better than everyone else. Delivering us from that idea seemed to be high on his agenda. And what kind of Messiah makes those kind of claims? And despite what many Christians believe, I don't think for a second Jesus' purpose was to die for our sins. His death is only meaningful because of the life that he lived, a life that revealed what an authentic life would look like. From start to finish, he modeled a different way of leading, and a deeper way of living, a way rooted in love and kindness and compassion. As he told stories about the God who causes it to rain on the good and the bad, a God who cares for widows and orphans, a God who makes demands on us, has expectations for us, who desires not our worship and adoration, but good actions like feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, caring for and welcoming the stranger, offering radical hospitality. There wouldn't have been a sane Israelite in Jerusalem who thought the Messiah would look and act like that. And yet slowly over time, it dawned on that most unlikely crew of his closest followers that maybe that really was what the Messiah was about, one who would turn our world upside down, suggesting that power is found in weakness, that the poor are blessed, and that the merciful, not the mighty, will rule the world, not with swords, but with peace and love. So what, what does it all mean for us? What does this topsy-turvy way of living and seeing the world the way Jesus did have to do with any of us? To be honest, lots of days I'm not so sure. You see, lots of days I don't want to serve others. Often I, I joy, enjoy being served and pampered, treated as though I were someone special. And I'm not sure I want to give indiscriminately. I don't want to be last. And most days I'm not into going the extra mile or turning my cheek. But every once in a while, I have those fleeting moments when I actually do some of those things Jesus talked about. And I come alive and I feel better about myself. To use some good Buddhist terminology, I live awakened to life and its possibilities. And we all know that following the Jesus way will be difficult and go against what our culture esteems as the good life. And I know too, and you know too, that we will fall short time after time. But if we're honest, his way does seem to be the authentic way to live. And it brings radical freedom on those moments when we actually live that way. And Jesus' way is in step and harmony with so many of the wise sages throughout history who insists that we find our life by losing it. And his way helps us to counter our culture's emphasis on keeping up appearances of measuring my worth by how much I have and what I achieve. But when I live in the Jesus way, I'm free for at least a moment to follow the passions of my heart. So let's not only join in the ancient chorus, Hosanna, save us from whatever we need to be saved, but let us realize that we're not to be devotees of Jesus, but we are called and invited to be partners with him. Amen. And in that spirit, please stand as we close this service, singing hymn number 495, called as Partners in Christ's Service.
alive and gathered together for worship, may we go forth with a great sense of joy, purpose, and peace, knowing that we all are called as Christ's partners. Amen.
But I did it anyway. Yeah. I would have been on time. I well, I you know, with the kids coming up and stuff, yeah. I'm just yeah. trying to get everything yeah. done today. Mm. Siblings. Because I know I won't have time after that. <laughs> so Matt and I are doing this final. 